Hello everyone. We're so sorry that we've had to cancel the bass festival, but we have had a great time with Edickson all this week here at USU, and we're glad to be able to share at least a little bit of that with you through these videos. I wanted to just have a chance to talk with Edickson and for you to be able to kind of listen in on this conversation and get to know him a little bit and his background and all his wonderful experiences because um, it's been such a great experience for us uh, here this week and wanted you to uh, be able to experience a little bit of that. So, Edison, why don't you tell us just a little bit about like how you got started playing the bass and some of your early musical experiences. Well, it was um, uh, endless search of my mother to make me busy, mm. not to let me too much time to, uh, to mess around and to get in trouble. So uh, she tried with me karate, she put me to swimming academy, and also I ended up in a choir. And it was uh, at some point in the street that she found another friend of her, and she heard about the children's orchestra. So she took me there and I, I got all the instruments present, and I wrote violin because it's the most famous thing mm -hmm. of classical <laughs> music. Sure. Mm, flute and viola, because the sound is this lower uh, register re really uh, took me, uh, my, took my interest at least. And yeah, they gave me the viola and the first lesson, the whole thing fall apart. Mm -hmm. The shoulder rest fall down, you know, to 11 years old or 10 years old kid, that's uh, traumatic. And then I couldn't tune it because this crow will keep coming back. I couldn't really stay fixed where I, I, I turn it to tune, and then uh, the last, the bridge collapsed. Mm -hmm. so, oh my goodness. And then on top, the, the position was with the neck completely bent, and I thought, no way. Then I'm not gonna get here, uh, how do you say, this uh, how do you say? On the uh, shoulder? Or yeah, you know, her, I, I'm not gonna hurt myself. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, in, the, in the first rehearsal, I, I saw the bass is very comfortable, yes. Staying, uh, how do you say, standing beside their basses, like waiting for the bass, and uh, we had to play eight notes in one bar, and they only had to play one. And you know, on the violin, like my teacher Anna said, one need one million notes to tell a story, and on the bass, one note can tell a story. Mm. So uh, this one note that they had by bar or pro bar, uh, it really took me. I could feel the also the presence of the instrument. So I, I talked to the guys and then I switched unofficially. Mm. And then the administration was mad at me. You know, if you ever change again, you will you get kicked out here. I stayed. And then I, I was very passionate to, to domain it, to command it. I think that doesn't really, I'm not, I haven't succeeded so far uh, all this time, but it's a trip of learning. And uh, I was very lucky to meet my teacher, Felix Petit, mm. right after the beginning. And uh, he, you know, he, you may disagree with me. But uh, I, today, you know, now I live in Berlin since nearly 20 years, and I have uh, been able to, to to see other schools. And it's difficult for me to see how, for in these uh, prestigious conservatories, uh, only the best are taken. Mm -hmm. And then, this, if someone wins an audition, it uh, means oh, what a great teacher. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I have such an admiration for you uh, personally because you take the, the student from uh, really the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, that's the, the hardest job. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to take a, a already done, an already educated bassist, mm -hmm. uh, give him one or two year lesson, the guy wins an audition and says, I am a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I admire so much of you, and uh, I only can 
uh, how you say, I, can only, I only can appreciate that because of my own teacher. Mm. All of his students were also from nothing. Mm. And few students are advanced. We, we were really nothing. You mm. know, my mother was a taxi driver. Sure. Fire with 50 years old, no job, you have to you know, jump to the car, uh, and the most, one of the most dangerous cities of the world, mm. and um, earned uh, her daily money to, to make, you know, to buy something to eat, and it was on a daily basis. And uh, still, this guy has taken the, the challenge uh, several times, not just then. The uh, students are in Japan, are in, um, in Europe, many of them, mm. uh, they have won the ISP, they have won the Japan prizes. Uh, no, not only one, at least three have won the ISP. And uh, he's now in Florida. His name is Felix Petit. Yeah. And, and we still, I, I'm still having lessons with him. Every time I learn a new piece, I play for him first after I have ever learned it or so, or maybe in the beginning. And uh, it's an endless process. And I, I, I was so lucky to meet him because mm. he, he is so, so determined to solve problems, not to solve the symptoms mm. of the uh, students. Uh, he really goes to the, to the, the, the mistake mm. and not to the result. Sure. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, repair the result. He goes to the mistake and resets the motion mm. with his teaching. And uh, a part of that, this system Venezuela uh, skip the theory of music and the, all the bureaucracy and all the orthodoxy of music uh, studying and we learned by doing. We, even when I was there, you know, with a viola and asking myself what am I doing here, I didn't know how to hold the viola, I didn't know how to hold the bow, we were having the first general rehearsal of the yeah. strings. So we really learned, it's like the driving, the car driving lessons. You step into the car and drive. Mm -hmm. You have your your moments of of mistakes, but then you know I have to really balance the, how I do it with the foot, and and then we do, uh, we we did that for many years, maybe five years, wow. in the youth orchestra, and then I joined the major orchestra. Luckily, as you know. Uh, after two auditions, and then actually I was uh, willing to come to America because my teacher told me I should come to Curtis mm. to study with Hal Robinson, and I think I wrote him, or at least I intended. But uh, recently we met and he knew, mm. and he told me, "Well, it did work out anyway, <laughs> so mm -hmm. no problem." Um, but uh, then I met uh, Jan Saxel and. Germany in 2001, when I was picked up to join a World Youth Orchestra, which will be based in Germany, in the north. And then he told me, when I asked him, where should I go, because I couldn't go to Curtis or Europe, and he told me, well, go to where music was born. Mm. You know, Bach and Schubert and Beethoven and Mozart, and they all, there was, you know, their <laughs> The, their place, so I, I took that and I wanted to start with him and, and he told me no, he doesn't teach anywhere, but if I would join the Kayam Academy of the Berlin Philharmonic, then I would have the chance to start with him. So I did that with Sixteen, they didn't invite me and he and his his uh, boss that at that time, the principal Klaus Stoll, mm -hmm. had to argue with the director of the Academy in order that she would uh, admit I made an exception to invite me for the audition because actually these studies are post-grade mm. studies. So she called, uh, the sec her secretary called me by phone and told you are, with this telephone call, you are admitted to uh, do the audition in three days' time in Berlin. So I took the plane via Amsterdam with KLM, which is now gone from Venezuela, and, and was there and Jan changed everything of what I brought change octave, change note, change slur, change everything. I think I had a huge blackout <laughs> in the audition. I 
really had a hard time. They didn't know what to do and what to play. But somehow they accepted me. And then I started a whole year later because I had to finish school in Venezuela. And then uh, when I arrived one year later, six weeks after, were uh, this audition mm -hmm. for the orchestra, which I luckily uh, got a chance to, to, to play the trial. This is for the Berlin For the Berlin Philharmonic yeah. members. And uh, I had maybe seven or, or eight lessons with Maestro Stoller. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, he make the, the last details and he changed my life. Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, he told me, he teach me, and he taught me the, the traditions of Germany. In German music, I was playing uh, Beethoven 3, 5, 6, uh, 7, and 9, and then I was playing Mozart 40, 41. So it was really necessary mm. to know how they, they approach to it. And then I realized when I got the job that it was just the first of three years of trial uh, under observation, and then a very narrow rotation election after that. And uh, they took me and I stayed. And then I, I learned so much from the orchestra. I learned from from Stravinsky, to Henze, to Schubert, Haydn, with Simon Rado, which was a highlight. Mm -hmm. And Mozart and Beethoven, and with the great conductor, great soloist, and Brahms, Bruckner, which I, I never dreamed of, mm -hmm. and Mahler, and Abado, and Haydn, and, and Bulles, and Schoenberg, and Berg, and Pedan. And then I met Heinz Holliger, uh, the oboist composer and, uh, uh, and conductor from Switzerland, and he introduced me to modern music. We, and then I started playing with him, Salenka, and trio sonatas, and playing his pieces for the Abbe Solo, and then he would just write me a certain list of pieces which I should learn and learn from, which are Elliot Carter, Yuri Kurtak, Berio, Klaus Hoover, um, Alexander Yemnitz, the student of Schoenberg, and uh, who else? So many. And Donald Di Martino, the duo with Obo, Cinque Fragmenti, and uh, Alfred Schnittke. And mm. I, I went that list through the next years and then I that recorded um, a contemporary CD with him together. And um, then my, my dream always, for, uh, because of Janis Saxer, had advised me to learn about Schubert and Bach in the Anna Berlsma mm. recordings. Sure. I did that, and, and not only that, but other things. And Arado Lupu for Schubert and other things too. Mm. I definitely was obsessed with this cellist. Mm. And uh, once I was asked to go um, to Rotterdam to the Gerge Festival and teach there, I told them, look, I would love to go, but then I, I would love to get a lesson from one of your treasures in Holland, which is Anor Belsma. And then they organized it, and I got to meet him, and we, we came well with each other until the end, until, until, until he just died last year, recently, in July. And it were uh, 10 years of friendship, of learning, of three times a year, private lessons, two, two days each, each time, and very intense. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to learn. I had the sound in my ear, I had the recording, I, I had the, the, the dream, and then he explained me how. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had to, of course, play from manuscripts to avoid misunderstandings mis, uh, of editors. I, I had to, you know, really um, uh, how you say, uh, take my uh, historical instrument and put a setup which would fit the ancient music and that would fit our modern times because we have bigger holes sure. than they used to have. And they are, he always insisted me, you don't have to play a string, that's expensive yeah. and that's tricky. But uh, he, he liked the bass from the beginning, the sound, and then I, I organized the uh, Hammerhead 18th century model bow mm. after the advice of one other colleague of mine, Ori Wolf. 
and I had to learn everything, you know. And then Yane had told me, of course, already about the Viennese tuning, and I tried the Van Hal, and then I tried Mozart, and then I tried Hofmeister. And Klaus, my teacher Stoll, he was very touched that I went through it because he never dared mm -hmm. to experiment the Viennese tuning. Yane had, but I think I think one or two pieces. Yeah. Maybe three pieces. Maybe, maybe you could explain Vini's tuning, because that's what you used for the theater store, right? Yes, that's actually the tuning that Mozart and Haydn knew. Mm. Uh, you know that Mozart used to play chamber music in Vienna. He was not worthy of becoming the composer of the court. That was Salieri. Mm. And then mm. he, just, he would just be uh, engaged or booked to play Sundays some Sundays, chamber music. So we play quartets with Haydn in the viola, with Dieter playing the violin beside him, and Van Hal playing the cello. Mm. And that's how these fellows, they, they, they had fun. Some critic wrote from that period that they didn't play together all the time. Can you imagine mm. all these four <laughs> <laughs> tempers <laughs> trying to cope with each other? Luckily, Van Hal wrote us a piece in the 18th century right. for the Viennese tuning, which was the basic new uh, tuning in third and fourth, actually a major, major chord with the dominant in the bottom. You know, if you're in D major, A, D, F sharp, A, or if you're in E flat major, which is very normal, uh, B, S, G, B, mm -hmm. and uh, Everything is accord, uh, across the, the strings. Mm -hmm. You finally get, uh, let's say, a much, much more worthy instrument, yeah. uh, like violin or cello or viola, with a low, really low and really high string, mm -hmm. which is not the case of our fourth tuning double bass, which is more narrow. Sure. It's, a, it's amazing to watch you play the Dijkstra and to see all those arpeggios that are just straight across yeah. you know, and the harmonics where you don't have to be trying to jump around to navigate that and the resonance that the instrument can have in that tuning. Yes, uh, you know the, the all these uh, wonderful instrumentalists like Kraft or uh, the Haydn Concerto and Boccherini, they all play only uh, through all four mm. strings in fan position. They believed in what, I, what Arner says it was a family conversation where the lowest string is the grandfather voice and the third lower string is the father voice and the second string is the child mm -hmm. or um, a teenager or sort of whatever maybe the son the son and the highest string is the mother's role the mother's um, uh, yeah role yeah. Can you talk about that in relation to the box suites? Because I know you were referencing that earlier this week in a lesson and how we sometimes play so many of those movements just on the G string and the D string yes. and we kind of cut out some of those roles that you're talking about. Uh, well, of course, we're certainly in death to those who dare and, and, and went through the eyes uh, really making the first steps to approach the Bach suites, those, if I'm not wrong, they were uh, Francois Rabat, and um, I'm trying to think, well, of course, Paul Casares, without any doubt, but I mean, in the bass, I remember Francois Rabat. I think, I think Gary has some recordings of almost all of the suites, maybe. Yes. Yeah. So, but I think maybe, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. Right, old ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the suites were really taboo. Mm. And uh, it has been a shame. Mm. I am um, so grateful to all my, uh, how do you say, my predecessors? Yeah, yeah, predecessors. Yeah. Predecessors who cleaned up mm. the way for us younger bases. They they did what they could, they did, they, they had, they were so, in, had an in, in, incredible, immense courage to dream about it. I, I know until uh, maybe four years ago, I didn't even dream of 
playing Bach on the bass because I was under the wing of honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember him telling me in our first meeting that he doesn't teach bass players who wants to play for him Bach mm -hmm. because it doesn't make sense for him. Wow. And, and of, I, well, luckily I was <laughs> there with Dittersdorf and Harald and Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> and even that, he asked me, the person says, are you sure that is the tuning for that piece? Because <laughs> I was playing, you know, mm. uh, vertically. Oh, sure. And then he, t he teach me how to cross the string and, and tell me why. Mm. You know, these colors, which makes uh, the instrument richer, mm. makes this uh, family conversation. If you play the normal G there, in the fourth string, and uh, it's not the same uh, maturity mm. of the open first string. Mm. Here you have experience, you have a belly like mine, <laughs> you have maybe a beard which I don't s still have managed to have, and uh, maybe a mustache. So it's, it's really uh, mm -hmm. it's it speaks depth. for itself. Yeah. Yeah. It has uh, more dimension than just the, the great open string which you, can, you, you can't do much with it. Sure. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that will change, but I, I'm very happy that I could find a way to use also the other strings and not just two strings in order to match the cello approach mm. to these works, mm. these pieces. And uh, also the classical concerto is the same. Mm. The, the, in that time you must imagine that the virtuosity was not in the left hand. The virtuosity was always in the right hand, and the, as Geminiani said in his books in the 16th century or the 17th century, um, the bow was played as it comes. Mm. There was not this a very recent uh, way to play to always start with a down bow and end with a down bow. Mm. I was m very much f coming from the French uniformation. The, the French, they, they made that everyone had the same thing in their hands. That's how the, the basses ended up playing like this. Mm. Uh, because they, they needed, you know, the bass come from the gamba. And the gamba is under the stick. You, you mm. grab it under the stick. And then the violone was also under the stick. There were, of course, some players that did. But it was in France the 20 violins of the king mm. who were specialists in this to mark every bar with the down bows and end it with a down bow. It, it had nothing to do with the, the, the pre, uh, previous centuries. Mm. The bow was always as it came, back and forth. It doesn't matter what comes. And that is how Bach uh, really speaks for itself. He, he was a fencing master. Mm. Uh, the, the real virtuosity in that time you could only notice by the right hand. Mm. That was the virtuosity hand. Left was not that important like nowadays. Mm. And like that, uh, it's everything. I mean, the Mo Mozart also did the scordatura for the concertante. In the viola, he, he really insists to tune up half tone every string in his E flat uh, concertante, and it, and it makes sense. E, e flat is an open string, B flat is an open string, everything is in one position, you have to shift, mm. there are many harmonics, and then the viola becomes not a, a muted instrument beside the violin, it's also a bright instrument. Mm. And Bach also knew it. In the, um, you can see it in, in the fifth suite when he the tunes mm. after or very four suites with the quint, you mm. know, fifths. Sure. Uh, he detunes for the fifth, the A string to G. Mm. It was the Bolognese uh, uh, tuning. And it, it, it makes sense when you think that the key is C minor. Yeah, the dominant. And then you have the dominant, not just a dominant that you play and it happens to be the dominant but with a resonance string, mm. which makes a nice effect around that note. It's also the heart mm. of the piece. And it's very sad, very sad to, to see nowadays that th this is being rejected mm. by modern uh, cellists and modern 
the schools. It's coming up slowly because mm -hmm. you know we are in kind of fashion. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I'm sure that Kasati and know that. Mm -hmm. How will he know that? Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be done uh, the research work, which he had no time to. He had to conduct and teach. Play himself was a star. But uh, that's our duty now. Mm -hmm. Take over. And uh, I feel very lucky to have taken over all these transcriptions of the suites. For instance, for instance, the G G major third suite, which which a uh, high C string you can play it, and that it sounds in the right key, like mm. the cello. I didn't do it today because sure, yeah. I forgot my C string on the, <laughs> in the hotel. But I was amazed how how well it still works yeah. that low. Yeah, and. Um, and you were just in solo tuning for those performances. Yeah, I yeah. happened to have my my Viennese tuning set up with the high B mm -hmm. flat. I just went down. Is anyway an A string. Sure. It was just pulled up. Yeah. And you know, Paganini also believed in scordatura. Mm. Uh, his violin concerto was actually in E flat. Mm. And nowadays, everybody plays in D. Mm. Then he tuned half tone higher. The violin and um, uh, Viva, this uh, Baroque composer and violinist, to play his rosary sonatas on the violin, you need four different violins wow. with four different uh, scordaturas tuning, and he was so so um, uh, create creative with the rosary sonatas, the, the first uh, the nativity and the passion and the resurrection, whatever, and uh, the, the old mean, you know, the cross, when they cross the, the strings, mm. and the lowest is in the, in the highest position, and the, mm. the highest is in the lowest, and it's, it's always been there since yeah. so long, yeah. and it, 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 first de uh, it first died with Beethoven meeting Dragonetti, who played in fourth and seeing the possibility to double the cello octave. Mm. And since that moment, he asked the Viennese bass players to switch their uh, tuning from third and fourth, uh, as we do, to tuning fourth, like Mr. Dragonetti, mm. in order to double well the cello octave. They had five strings. They didn't have extension. Mm. And so they could play the, the storm of the pastoral mm. easily. I don't know if that easily, but <laughs> but I'm sure they easier. they did. <laughs> yeah, easier. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 uh, so who who buried the double the Viennese double bass in Vienna was Botticini himself mm. in 1841 when he had his concert in Vienna on three strings, mm. playing Bellini, playing Paganini, playing Donizetti, playing his own pieces and. Really, nobody wanted to play this anymore because the, the star of Vienna, Beethoven, mm. asked not to, and then these guys they, they felt like, What are we doing? <laughs> and it, it died, and now I took kind of bit, bit over to record at least 10 works for it, uh, uh, seven concerti, and then two duos mm. I mean, one sonata for cello, one sonata with, with viola. And then the two areas, per questa bella mano, la Selene del tuo fuoco. Per questa is Mozart, Selene is Schwerger. So I took a bit over to record that and then they write, let's commission new pieces for the tuning. Mm. Like you saw, the right. Forgotten Lullaby, it's a one mini movement of an entire suite oh, wow. for this tuning. And then the, the four voices fugue mm. for double bass solo. By Heinz Holliger, you maybe have heard the piece. I, I don't know if I know that piece. Yes, it's it's, it's a hell of a wow. difficult. Huh. These eleven eleven pages all black. Wow. <laughs> for Viennese tuning, and then now Latin American music with the Barroquianas, mm. uh, by, written by Frank Osher. And so many pieces uh, that uh, from contemporaries, the uh, Kelterborn, Gerd Friedrich Haas, mm. who recently wrote me a solo piece, Toshio Toshio Hosokawa. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, you know, we're ashamed, like mm. I said in the beginning, and just trying to collaborate a little. Yeah. 
and then uh, make uh, some space for the next to take over. Yeah. Can I ask you, you're, you're talking about, you know, so much music, and I know earlier when we were about to record the, the box suites, you were even, you were playing a little bit of the second suite, and you were kind of up in the air, like, ah, oh, maybe I should play the second suite, and then you decided, ah, oh, we'll just, we'll stick with the plan and do the first and the third. But I, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know, well, you know, I can't imagine just on the fly trying to decide, oh, should I just play all of the third suite or all of the second suite or hmm, let me flip a coin, you know, like that's so much music to have in your mind. Can you, can you talk about like how you go about learning music and maybe how you go about memorizing music? Like, do you have a specific approach and, and yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll just ask too, because I know this came up earlier this week too, if, 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 Solfege plays a role in that at all. Yes. And kind of yes. how you approach that. Definitely a big key mm. in, in our language and in our way to learn music is the solfege. And this is the fixed do solfege, is, is how we think of it. Because here in the States, in music schools, oftentimes we learn where whatever key you're in, that tonic is do. Oh my gosh. So That's... it's always changing versus C always being do. You know, yeah, D yeah. always being re and re in between and yeah, I, I I feel very lucky to remember the pieces by their name. Yeah. So if it's uh, four symphony of Tchaikovsky, then fa mi re do re mi re la mi and it's it's fun. Yeah. Then I I know the notes what they called and then I can memorize them and uh, in my mind to play them uh, on, uh, by memory. Yeah. I recall them. You know, sure. I call the 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 memory yeah. this this thought and uh, of course while I want to learn as a piece by memory which is new or the old ones it's uh, four four memories come to play the first is of course the optic memory the one you see then comes of course the audible for your ears and then comes the muscle memory which is made up of electricity or mm. chemical yeah, uh, reactions like the of the kind of nerve system. Yeah, and then the most important I find is the intellectual memory, mm. which is when you know the piece begins in D major, and then it goes to B, uh, B minor, and then there is a transition mm. to G major, so many bars, and then you're yeah, in analyzing what's happening. Yes, and then yeah. you know the, se the segments. Mm of the piece and then you know uh, the intellectual memory also uh, memorize slurs, bowings, uh, the strings, uh, fingering, mm. uh, sounds, uh, colors, not only just the notes. Sure. The notes are only showing a way deeper message mm. uh, which hides mm. behind them and this is our duty. Yeah to discover the message of the of these symbols. Yeah. At, at what point when you're learning a piece, how early on do you try to kind of determine wh what your fingerings or bowings, do you try and do that at the beginning or do you wait till you've kind of gotten familiar with the piece or what's that process like? I think it, it changes. Sure. Of course there is, I would say, a good, a good 93% of the piece you hit already from the beginning mm -hmm. with the fingering, but there is a 7% that may change. You have to figure out. Yeah, thing. the color, maybe, yeah. uh, you know, especially when it's in, in the scordatura, which is an instrument that we don't play every day, sure. that we pick up maybe once a day or, mm -hmm. or, or every, every, every two or three days. Um, they were not so familiar mm -hmm. with it, and then you, you end up discovering, ah, actually, second string sounds better than the first, mm. or, or tells me more. Or, um, it is a process and it always changes. Of course, my first approach is mostly go over four strings. I adore how Pinkas Zuckerman plays the G string mm. and, the, and the, e, the D string on the violin. This is a tradition that is no longer anymore uh, actual in yeah. our violin uh, schools, we, we tend to cross strings. Mm. It's the easier way. But to really 
course, now I am contradicting myself mm -hmm. because I told you first that we should cross all four strings back and forth in order to play horizontally. Yeah. But on the same time, the romantic pieces, they, they are full of this, what were they call uh, cantinelas, mm -hmm. and this cantabile, which they are so powerful mm -hmm. on the low strings played in high positions. Mm -hmm. And that is also gone. Mm. So if you if you imagine the uh, ancient repertoire, which should be played horizontally, it's being played vertically, mm. and the um, romantic uh, repertoire, which should be played vertically, in order to have a better legato, in order to have a, a, a really to take the juice out mm. of the string and not just to press down on the bridge. Uh, they, then they they cross <laughs> strings, you know what you yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. and uh, that's the contradiction. Mm. And you, when you s when you listen to the recordings of Sarasate and and Joseph Joachim, they all loved the legato mm. of the left hand, mm. that every note was connected with each other. Nowadays we very much play like piano, mm. one note by one note, and they are and not related. Mm to each other. And what I, I find uh, most critical is the real legato of the right hand, which it disappears more and more. Mm. We tend to mark so much mm. with the right hand. Yeah, I was working with your students so, so well, all these mm. matters. And uh, I hope that you, uh, you, you agree too yeah, of course. when I, they, they yeah. come up with yeah. that again. I always, I mean, and some of this, I think, in some ways, I, I relate to the left hand as well, as much as the bow is a part of it, but I feel like it's, it's generally pretty easy to play separate. It's always hard to play connected yes. and legato. So that's what we should always work on, because it's not too difficult to separate the notes, to put space in between the notes, but it's really hard to make everything one note right into the next, like a, like a singer, a single breath. No. Yeah, you, you, you just said it, and a, a part of that, uh, uh, there is this habit to practice short, mm. and then you practice short something, and then when you speed it up, it, the, the gap is still there, right. you mentioned, yeah. but it mess up the, the, the end result because it's still there, you trained it, you, right. you, you memorized it like yeah. that. So that's why I always practice long. Mm. Everything, also Mozart or whatever. Of course, if I'm playing continuo, I'm not playing long. Sure. I also don't practice the continuo. <laughs> <laughs> but in all for the rest, yeah, yeah. I, it, because there is this also stutter no? mm. thing. Stutter, okay. stutter. Yeah. That when someone plays a note wrong, and then instead of seeing why the left hand didn't do the right distance shift, the, 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 mm. the bow starts to stutter mm. instead of getting the bow by side mm. and carrying, uh, how was it? Most, mostly now, the, the, what I see when I teach is that the vibrato is not regular, mm. it's not constant. Mm. Uh, me, most of students, they tend to vibrate only when they have time, mm. and not Continuous when it should be. Sure. Mm. And then they, 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 do, they do nothing, then the, the end of the, no, the phrase, because now it's, it's a silence, they vibrate it. Mm. And then, yeah, and then mostly shifting is too fast, and mm. that's why they don't hit the note. Mm. And yeah, I see also the, the, another big matter is the point of contact mm. of, the, of the string that Mostly, mostly of the students, they change the point of contact in one note, mm. which actually should be in between notes. Mm. It, uh, if, and, and it should be horizontal. People go up with the bow, you mm. know, and stroke diagonally. Or yeah. And um, another thing I've seen is the, the, the string changes. They, people tend to use the entire arm to change this little. Mm centimeters or inches mm. 
uh, which are far from one string to the other, instead of playing the real and the legato here, no, with the sure. right hand. Those are actually the m most typical yeah. uh, problems of students when I meet them. And then I would add uh, the strength mm. of the hand, which uh, it has to be uh, constantly uh, um, trained. Mm. And I find that very much that uh, people just go and play, don't really train. Sure. You know, at home I do some flexions right. and I do some Exercise. planks. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the same is for the, for the left hand, that uh, we have to train it every day, like toothbrushing. Mm. And for all of that, I have exercises from the from many schools, from Streicher, from Millet, from uh, Petraki, from Duncan McTeer. We take the best of everyone. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe in in just a few minutes, we'll transition. Maybe just to have you show us maybe some of your favorite exercises or things that are like. I do this every day, like brushing the teeth or, you know, stuff that are just part of your routine. I can show you, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, and maybe as a part of that, uh, I would be curious, too, because we have, you know, we tend to have students from a variety of backgrounds, some that are very early on in their development, and then others that are more advanced. And, you know, you mentioned your early teacher and how great he was at taking students from the beginning. Yes. And so I would be curious, like, what maybe what advice you have for students that are pretty early in their development or also what approaches to practicing or playing do you think have led to the success of students who started from the very beginning and like you said were winning competitions after that what are some of those approaches that really help them be successful <laughs> well uh, certainly the the orchestra practice sure because in orchestra you learn everything. Mm. You learn not only to play Eccles mm -hmm. and to play Capuzzi, but you learn to play Haydn and uh, Beethoven. Mm. And then you your playing is immediately richer. Mm. And maybe if you're lucky, Shostakovich and Prokofiev. And so, uh, if you're also again lucky, some Schubert and Mahler. And definitely the orchestra practice is essential mm. to cut mm. to cut the, the interest mm. of the young musician and then he needs to become better. Mm. So the, the, the his own pressure puts him motivation yeah. to 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 do what he has to do and pay the price that he has to pay in order to become better. Mm. And of course time is priceless mm. and it's very valuable. It's good to always be open mm. and uh, take the best from everyone. Mm. Because I believe the truth, nobody has the absolute truth, it's spread. Mm. Everybody owns mm. a piece of the truth. Right. And only those who are open enough to, to watch and also maybe take something from someone else. This from this person, this from this person. Exactly. Yeah. Those may have the most in their own back. Mm. You know, they, they collect from everyone. Yeah. And uh, music has always been open for everyone. It's like the sun. Mm. It doesn't really goes away. Yeah. If you don't, if you hate the classical music, you have pop. <laughs> if you have pop, you have uh, uh, rock. And if you have if you have rock, you have tango. If you hate tango, you have salsa. If you, you hate salsa, you get merengue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has always been there. You, you, you yeah. can't run for it. It's like the sun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's go over some of those exercises. And uh, yes. you know, you for those of you who are watching, you'll notice that uh, Erickson is actually playing a French bow German style here because we had a little bit of a wardrobe malfunction, I'll call it, uh, with his bow during the uh, concert. Maybe we'll put that in the outtakes. All right, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Video. Yeah. That would be great. So, I, 
I will demonstrate a few exercises which um, I like very much to work. We'll move this. Why don't we have you maybe come back just a little bit, yes. and then I think we'll be able to get you yeah. in, the, in the camera here. Yeah, that's much better. So one of the exercises I like to to fortalize the left hand is the one by Petraki, which is. <laughs> variations uh, with the fifth. <laughs> and the adrenaline goes too high, yeah. the muscles become weaker and there is this mm. extra uh, strength of the fingers sure. who will definitely hammer down the string yeah. even if you are weaker. Sure. And I, I suggest that also for people that has their own um, exercises to strengthen the left hand, which is not the tracky, to insist to hammer with the left hand to whatever they are doing. Then to, to solve the, the shifting problems, I, I recommend this, also by Petraki. He does it in octaves. I myself, I think it's a fantastic uh, exercise. I like it actually to practice all the intervals to the same notes because we don't play in octaves. Sure. We, we are here. This is our... You have every possible... Our work interval. area, yeah. let's say. Yeah. So I, I just take the lowest note. <laughs> shouldn't be fast, sure. it should be as uh, slow as I can follow with the ear, mm -hmm. the note, and then know when to stop, otherwise I stop too early or too, mm -hmm. or too late. Sure, yeah. And uh, then I have all the intervals, and then on top of that I, I suggest to do the same thing with the upper octave. <laughs> I suggest to go the next octave, which th that was what Botticini did, you know. Well, now the, the strings, they need to be clean. Oh, yeah. And here you're kind of pressing on the side of the string? Yes, I do the same technique. I do the same technique that Botticini, that he pulled the strings. He pulled the strings to a side and lifted them. Yeah, and you're kind of pushing on the inside of the string, pushing it to the edge of the fingerboard. Now the strings are very dirty with, <laughs> the, um, with the rousing of the concept, but uh, normally it, it can go a little more smoothly. The, the thing you use this uh, area for it's for Botticini, hmm. because he, he wrote in his do second concerto this place that most of people play harmonic. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it now because of the tuning. Oh, sure. yeah. The 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 Venice tuning that I have, but it's the, the place that is la di da di da da. Sure. He yeah. Writes up a, the triads. A, he yeah. writes a, a crescendo. He writes a forte. But mm. how do you do that here in harmonics? In post, nobody mm. does. It. So I believe is he used his own technique. <laughs> and then uh, the also the other passage is the mm -hmm. 
it's really opera. Yeah, and right. Finally, that's for the shifting, and then for the bow, the string, uh, string changes. Well, uh, first of course half. Just turning the bow without using the whole arm, you know. Interesting. And here is the real legato, you know. string is not speaking. It's so, so weird. Yeah, I think the mistake is to go like this. You, you see, sure. there is a gap there. And then you do a, a quarter. Then eighth. And then some equators. Yeah. Can I ask? I know obviously we, we don't have a, uh, an actual German bow here, so it's it's not as ideal. But can you talk a little bit about just the German bow hold? Maybe for people who play German bow, yes. or maybe people who play French but maybe want to experiment a little bit with German bow. What are some of the essential? elements of a good German bow hold? Well, I think the, the, the hold is always personal. Mm. I cannot tell you this is the only one. Mm. Of course, a great player can take the bow with his feet <laughs> and it will sound great. Yeah. You, you've seen people drawing with their foot <laughs> and the feet and it doesn't really matter. But generally what is important about the bow hold is not to take the bow but to hold the bow. Mm. And uh, they should be loose and flexible to create, to, mo to manipulate, to, to add. Mm. And if this is stiff, there will not be much variety. Mm. And it should be an extension of your body, of your arm, of your back. And actually, the tip of the fingers should be like electro uh, points. Who actually makes magic and electricity with the stick? Mm. The stick becomes an extension of your arm mm. and not a tool mm. uh, which is completely strange to your body. Mm. It should all uh, meld together. I, I, I notice very much when uh, the, the musician is here and the music is there. The, I think our message. And our duty is to become messengers mm. and not just the uh, 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 narrators. Mm. But they uh, to, to um, how you say, encarn mm. the message. Mm. And then another uh, exercise, well, it's picato, it's, it's a whole chapter for itself. But definitely <coughs> biting the string, you know. And you're coming kind of st straight down on it. Yeah. With a little bit of it. Yeah. So when I do this, I bite it, mm. and then when I do that, I bite it also, mm. frisbee throwing. Mm. And, and uh, the point of contact exercises. Just with a, with a mirror, from the frog to the tip, watching that whatever we play, the bow strokes horizontally and not like this. Just yeah. straight across. Yeah, because yeah. The, the point of contact should remain in one note equal. And you can change, but between notes, to, mm. for the next note. I know. That is where I always focus with the with the mirror, that the bow strokes all in the same place, and the both hands move parallelly. If I go down here, that the the, the right hand doesn't stay in the same spot, mm. but then I get it's a diminuendo closer to the bridge. Yeah, that it goes it goes down below with the left hand, and things like that. Those are um, actually the the principal. Uh, things that one should uh, care of. Also the posture on the base, 
now they, uh, we tend to lean the bass on us. Mm -hmm. I think the bass should be straight and we wait for the bass beside it. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to, to also approach the bass, get inside it. And sometimes I see my colleagues playing with the bass in between them and mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. So they, they have a long way to the G string Mm -hmm. And then the bow, of course, strokes not kind of throws off the angle not straight. And, and um, yeah, I like I, I I don't like nothing to be between me and the bass, mm. only my belly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I come here and I face kind of face the bass with my tummy, and then I can get so well in the G string. It's like cellists. The best cellists were always those who didn't play with Spike, hmm. like Boccherini, like Francom, like Duport, or Romberg, or Piatti, or, you know, uh, uh, Servé. And that the same was with the basses. Uh, the, the best basses were always playing standing, hmm. because they had the freedom hmm. to, to as, as I say, to incant music mm. and uh, sitting ha more more than half of your weight is in the chair mm. and then you have to compensate that by pressing with the right hand mm. and then the sound it's always pressed mm. and it's not natural and it doesn't resonate so long mm. and it doesn't also doesn't project so well in the hole because it's 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 so pressed that it stays also here if you let it ring, and, and, and it definitely flies. Mm. That's what's the point. And I, I see more and more bass players sitting for comfort. I also play sitting too. But and then when I when my teacher told me to, to stand up, I, I felt a pain in my legs. He told me, look, but I see the fingerboard so well, mm. look. And I was missing the best. And I was uh, having someone between me and the bass, and well, luckily I was 16, mm. and I, he made me stay, stood up. And, and, I, and now, when I play, si play sitting in the orchestra, I play with the same approach than playing standing. Mm. I don't put the bass there and me here. I just put it aside and <laughs> play with it. Use your body and use the weight. And Using the, the the what you say, the body and the the back. Another common thing uh, nowadays and always have been th how the, the hand rest mm. has been damaged and people get injured because of this posture. I think the, the pressure should be to the back without the thumb. Mm. Of course you cannot learn the bass practicing like this. You get crazy or frustrated sure. because the hand is too weak. Of course you learn first like this, of course uh, it would be nice to try not to get there at a certain point. Then you should realize, again with the other exercises, that it should be also possible to play without the support of the thumb. Sure. You will give you a, a more life, more life uh, for the left hand, yeah. left arm, and of course Something which I didn't do in my entire childhood was to care for the real instrument, which is the body. Mm. Uh, it's important to stretch, it's important to strength those muscles we don't use, it's important to get the length of those muscles who get shorted, mm. it's important to warm up mm. that the blood circulation in the muscles occurs, uh, you know, by doing it a hundred times before you play a note, mm. both arms, and then uh, it's important the, the temperature of the muscle uh, to be, I don't know, mm. what is it, uh, 37 degrees or mm. uh, Celsius, and otherwise uh, you get a cramp mm. and you get injured because uh, yeah. the muscles are so, such a miracle, but also they, they, they have an ideal environment. Mm where they function the best. Mm. And uh, not only that, but also the nutrition 
it's important to 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 be careful of the big complex vitamin, the B12, B6, B9, and uh, the also the other minerals, uh, magnesium, potassium, calcium. Because nowadays the food doesn't have that much. Mm. We have to to do some supplements in order to get all what we need. Protein is very important to the body. You, the, the strongest uh, beast in, on, on earth, a bull doesn't eat meat. He eats plants. And the, the, the protein by plants is definitely way more better than the animal. Mm. It lasts more mm. and it gives you more benefits, more results, more strength. So I, 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 I started to eat um, um, vegetal protein. Mm. And uh, a part of that, of course, the, the, the omegas oh, sure. for the brain and, yeah. and the Q10, the coenzyme, and so many things that mm. we, nowadays we don't care about it. Mm. The first instrument is you. If you are not well, you will not will be, you will not be well to the instrument. And in the future, I dream of me playing the French bow for Botticini. <laughs> And uh, then playing the German ball for Wagner, mm. and I hope I succeed on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Edison. you so this much, so Raúl. Yes. Maybe any any last words of advice for students or young bassists or uh, anybody who you know maybe is kind of in the earlier stages of their playing or their career and. And you know, here you are. I went from, you know, playing in the El Sistema to now the Berlin Phil, and and being a wonderful soloist. Um, what what advice would you have for young and upcoming musicians, bassists? You know, uh, since I am small, I have always experienced that uh, you will always find resistance mm. on your way. You will always be criticized, and you. We always find people who uh, would love to be yourself <laughs> and uh, to have chances like you had and, and uh, maybe have your girlfriend <laughs> or have your dad who buys you a car or yeah. have your, your destiny to, to, to be born in a beach in, in Australia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody wants exactly what they don't have. Sure, sure. If they have curly hair, they, they want the opposite. <laughs> and if they have the opposite, they, they want their curls. And if they have green eyes, they want blue eyes. Mm. So it's normal. It's mm. human beings. And uh, the most important is to, uh, for me at least, to be assured, to be sure that you're doing the right thing. Mm. That, uh, for me, music is bigger than anything else and anyone else. Mm. I, I serve music. I don't serve music industry or <laughs> or, or nobody. I serve music first. I, the music was first, and and most of, of us today, we like to teach a lesson to the composers. Mm -hmm. We teach every day a lesson to Mozart how this, his music should be, and he cannot defend himself. He only barely wrote it <laughs> in, in a hurry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing with Bach. Uh, we we teach him uh, every day a lesson how his music should be and. Mm, I, I think to to have the, the the humility to be humble enough to say wait I will bleed first before I change this man's uh, original idea. Of course, sometimes there is a slur which is impossible in forty c c c c c c c c yeah. <laughs> then you have to change. Uh, well, it is fine, especially if you're in a section. But um, you will always find as a young. And, and a later experience based their criticize, criticisms and, 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 um, and yeah, people who will make you see if what you do is worth doing it. Mm. And then when you, you keep your way, you see what's worth doing it. Mm. And all these obstacles have always been there to just show you if what you are doing is worth doing it or you should better quit and mm. do something else. Mm. Right? That's, Every, in every travel I, I, I go, I find this wall and these uh, limitations and restrictions and, and negativity. And when I have succeeded, I know why I, I succeeded. It, it was to, 
to, to, to feel destiny. Mm. And we are, as I say, we're ashamed. Mm. We're, we're just taking over and giving on. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're so glad that at least through this video and, and the videos of these performances that you can experience a little bit of Edickson's residency here this week and I know that you're going to be inspired by these performances so thank you so much for sharing your music with us. God bless you guys I'm sorry this happened like that I imagine, I'm sure it's perfect how it went I, I, if, if we have a, if we have the same impact right? You, people would see it people would see what they should and copy and it's great <laughs> and people maybe come up with new ideas mm -hmm. and then maybe who knows we will reunite us again yes that'd be wonderful that'd be wonderful thank you so much yes, thank you thank you